Shabbat Shalom everyone, G. Stephen Simons here. I am so glad that you could join me for this home worship video resource. I am once again standing in the Dinosaur Valley State Park in Glen Rose, Texas. It's a beautiful setting, so enjoy the footage. The team and I just recently came off the road after eight months of travel and ministering in nine different states and I water immersed scores more people. If you're interested in seeing the water immersions, you can play the video entitled Water Immersions, the Western States Outreach, and you can enjoy the fruit of this ministry. The team and I are taking a little time to spend with our families. I came down to Texas, they went off to Tennessee. But when this video comes out on Shabbat, they will have reunited with me here in Texas and we are already thinking about and I'm praying about the upcoming fourth leg of our Returning to the Ancient Paths RV Outreach Tour, which will, Yah willing, begin in the spring after Pesach. And Yah willing, we will travel up the East Coast and down through the Deep South. So if you live in a state along the East Coast or if you're down in the Deep South, and you would like to be water immersed or attend a gathering, then send me an email at info at triumphandtruth.global and I'll get right back to you and we can begin to communicate about a possible gathering in your area. All right, it is time to blast our shofars. So if you'd like to blast your shofar with me, you may want to press pause, go get your shofar, and when we come back in the next segment, we will sound the alarm to Teshiva together. Hallelujah! It's time to quote the Shema. Have you memorized it yet? Just in case you're still learning it, we'll put the verses up on the screen. We're going to start with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. And like every week, let's say it together with real enthusiasm. Hear, O Israel, Yah our Elohim, Yah is one, Echad. And you shall love Yah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And then we go to the second Shema found in Torah, which is Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. Let's say it together. I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I require it of him. And then we go to Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning with verse 25, let's say it together. And I shall sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols, I cleanse you. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and you shall do them. Hallelujah! It's time to pray toward the land of Israel, so I want to invite you to stand up where you are and face in that direction. For me, it is this direction, and we're going to pray and intercede on behalf of the Jewish people of the land, as well as worldwide, for their safety, for their protection, for their well-being, and for their salvation. We're also going to be praying for the nations of the world as well as for our gatherings wherever they may be worldwide. Let's pray. 
Abba, we love you so much. And we are so very grateful for this wonderful opportunity to gather together as your people by way of video and worship you as creator and redeemer. We are facing the land of Israel. Our hearts are stirred to pray and intercede on behalf of the Jewish people. We are asking you to be a light in the darkness that they are facing at this time. We are so very thankful for the release of some of the hostages, and we pray for the release of all of the hostages. We ask that you would protect the innocent ones, and we pray that you would give guidance and wisdom and understanding to those who are in leadership positions that they might know what to do at this time. We're asking you to move powerfully by your spirit in the land of Israel and move upon the Jewish people, open up their eyes that as they read through the scriptures, they might see Yeshua and be convicted and call upon that one name by which we all must be saved, the name Yeshua, which means the salvation of Yah. We're also praying for all the citizens of the land of Israel, that many, many, many Jewish people and citizens of the land will come to know Yeshua as Master and Mashiach of Israel. And we pray that they would have a belief that would bring about a justification that leads to true Torah obedience and obedience to all of Scripture. We're also praying for the nations of the world. And we know you're gathering up Ephraim from every nation under heaven. And we are so blessed and so humbled that you would anoint us and use this ministry. We pray that you would empower people to push play and watch the videos and hear the messages and be convicted and call upon the name Yeshua for a justification that leads to true obedience to Torah and all of Scripture. We pray that you would continue to bring in Ephraim from all the nations under heaven, and we are so grateful that you would use us in the capacity that you are to bring in the harvest. We're also praying for our gatherings, and we're asking you to do what you can in our midst. Do the supernatural. Lift the fallen encourage the downcast, heal the sick. We ask that you would bless us as we worship you, transform us as we study your word. And we thank you that you are trustworthy to keep covenant with us as we keep our side of the covenant, which is to have a belief that produces obedience. We pray that all that we do and all that we say today will bring great esteem to you. And we pray these things in the powerful and wonderful name of your Son and our Master Mashiach, Yeshua. Amen and Amen. It's time to worship, and I want to share with you a wonderful psalm. This is Psalms 113. It says, Praise Yah! Praise, O servants of Yah! Praise the name of Yah! Blessed be the name of Yah now and forever. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the name of Yah is praised. Yah is high above all nations, his esteem above the heavens. Who is like Yah or Elohim, who is enthroned on high? He looks down on the heavens and in the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust, lifts the needy from a dunghill, to make him sit with the nobles, with the nobles of his people, causing a barren woman to dwell in a house, a rejoicing mother of children. Praise Yah! Long 
It's time for prayer, and I want to take you over to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to begin with verse 35. It says this, And Yeshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their congregations, and proclaiming the good news of the rain, and healing every disease and every bodily weakness among the people. And having seen the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his taught ones, the harvest truly is great, but the workers are few. Pray then that the master of the harvest would send out workers to his harvest. And so Yeshua was out doing the work. He was going from city to city and from village to village. He was proclaiming the good news of the rain of Elohim. He was healing sick people. He was healing bodily weaknesses among the people. And he saw the masses. He saw the crowds. He saw the condition that they were in, that they were weary and scattered as sheep having no shepherd. And the scripture says he was moved with compassion for them. He had a deep compassion for the hurting people that he saw with his eyes as he went from place to place. And his solution to this spiritual dilemma was to call his taught ones to prayer. He saw that the harvest was great, but the laborers were few. And so he told his taught ones, you need to pray that the master of the harvest would send out workers to his harvest. In other words, he was saying, pray for the harvest, pray for the ministry. And that's the emphasis that I want to place upon this prayer time today. I am asking you, I am calling you to pray for this ministry. Pray for our upcoming fourth leg of our Returning to the Ancient Paths RV Outreach Tour. Pray for our success. Begin to do spiritual warfare even now to assure our success. The enemy hates what we're doing. The fact that we just finished up eight months of travel and we ministered in nine different states and I water immersed scores of people. The enemy hates that. And he's going to do whatever he can do to thwart our progress. But we have power in prayer. And I'm asking you as a part of this family of belief to begin to pray with me for the success of this ministry. Pray for the anointing to be upon me that I might proclaim the word as I ought. Pray that a doorway of opportunity to proclaim the good news message of Yeshua and Teshuvah and the circumcision of Messiah will be opened up for us as we go from state to state and from place to place. Pray for those who will gather. Pray for those who will hear the message. Pray for those who will be circumcised in their hearts and receive the I want to obey heart and the power to be obedient. Pray that many, many, many more will hear and will obey. And when you do, when you support this ministry in prayer, then every person who is empowered, every person who is transformed, 
every person who receives the circumcision of Messiah is fruit on your tree of righteousness. So pray for the ministry, pray for our success, and y'all bless you as you pray. encourage you in your giving and take you over to a wonderful passage of scripture found in John chapter 6 beginning with verse 5. It says this, Then Yeshua lifting up his eyes and seeing a large crowd coming toward him said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for them to eat? And this he said trying him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for every one of them to receive a little. One of his taught ones, Andri, the brother of Shimon Kepha, said to him, Here is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these for so many? And Yeshua said, Make the people sit down, now there was much grass in the place, and the men numbering about 5,000 sat down. And Yeshua took the loaves, and having given thanks, 
he distributed them to the taught ones, and the taught ones to those sitting down. And the same with the fish, as much as they wished. And when they were filled, he said to his taught ones, Gather the broken pieces that are left over, so that none gets wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with broken pieces of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then the men, having seen the sign that Yeshua did, said, This is truly the prophet who is coming to the world. I want to focus on the boy who gave the five barley loaves and two fish. Obviously, he heard that the taught ones were trying to solve the problem of having thousands of people there who were hungry, who needed to be fed. And he wanted to contribute. He wanted to participate in the ministry. He wanted to do his part. I believe he realized that it wasn't much. Five barley loaves and two fish? Andre said, what is that amongst so many? In other words, how are we going to feed thousands of people with such a small offering? But that didn't dissuade this boy from bringing his offering. He wanted to help. His heart was stirred. He wanted to contribute. He wanted to give. He wanted to do his part to see that the thousands were fed. And I would hope that there would be many in the body of Messiah like this boy who are stirred in their hearts to contribute to the feeding of the thousands. Feeding them what? Feeding them the living word of Elohim. Bringing in that contribution, no matter what size, no matter how small. Because you're stirred in your heart to support the ministry, to participate in the work. And when you do, then thousands are fed the word. We're going from state to state and from place to place and scores of people are hearing the message in person. But many thousands are hearing the message, the message of Yeshua and Teshuvah and Yeshua's lifestyle Torah, the message of the circumcision of Messiah and the I want to obey hard and the power to be obedient. Thousands are being fed because there are people who have a heart like that boy who just want to support, just want to do their part. And I realize there are some people who say, well, what I have to give is so small, it wouldn't make a difference. And so they don't give at all. But don't be like that. Be like this boy who said, I don't have much to give, but what I have, I want to give, I want to contribute, I want to do my part. I want to help feed the thousands. And of course, Yeshua gave thanks and gave it to the taught ones to give it to the people. And everyone ate to the full. And they even picked up 12 baskets of fragments after they had eaten. And so the Father will bless a gift of any size. He will make it a blessing to the ministry, and it is a blessing to the ministry. He will also make the ministry bless others through the gift. And he will also bless the giver. And so I want to encourage you. Obey the giving commandments. Have a heart to participate in the ministry, to do your part, to help us feed thousands. And give to be a blessing and to be blessed. Keep these things in your mind and Yah bless you as you give.
So today we're going to talk about the practical. We've talked a lot about end time events, what to look for. We've talked about the fact that the falling away is to come first and must be completed before the anti Messiah can arise. And the falling away is the effect of the mystery of lawlessness. That's a spiritual dynamic headed up by Hasatan and demon forces. And the goal is to create an environment on the earth of lawlessness. Because if we were all following Torah, following Yeshua in his lifestyle of Torah, and Antimashiach rose up in that environment, he would be totally and utterly rejected because the environment would be that of obedience. And he is the man of lawlessness. He's the man of disobedience. So what is the mystery of lawlessness at work doing? Creating a spiritual environment on the earth of utter lawlessness. We see it working its way into religion as well. In the day that we're living in, we see whole denominations dividing over what the Bible clearly calls abominations. Now, why would denominations be dividing over abominations? Because at least half of them are embracing modern culture. And at the root of modern culture is the mystery of lawlessness. If you want to shape yourself to cause modern culture to be accommodated. In other words, you love the world. You love the things of the world. You talk like the world. You dress like the world. You act like the world. You go to where the world goes. You're just like the world. See, when you do that, then you are participating in creating this environment of lawlessness into which the lawless one will arise. And so there are many people who are in mixed up religion today and they're being swept in to this environment of lawlessness because they're not set apart. They're not committed to obedience. They don't know their Bible as they should. They don't have that deep, personal, intimate relationship with Yah. They haven't received Yah's breath the spirit of Yah. And so when this mystery of lawlessness is at work, they get swept right into it. So once the falling away has been completed, then we know that anti-Mashiach is going to rise up and he's going to be accepted. He's going to be applauded. He's going to be praised. And from what we've been saying, He's not the most evil looking one out there. I know a lot of people who say, oh, I see this president over here and he's just evil. His policies are evil. And I would say to you that anti mashiach is going to cloak himself in a cloak of light, just like it says about Hasatan, that he masquerades as a messenger of light. He's not going to be the most obvious one. He comes with great powers of deception and he's going to deceive many. They're going to look at what he does and they're going to think, wow, who can who can argue with a peacemaker? And he's going to be a problem solver and he's going to be a very charismatic politician. He's even going to appeal to religious people. He's going to have a religious side to him. And he's going to have a false prophet. And this false prophet has the appearance of a lamb. He has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks with the voice of a dragon. And what that says to me is the false prophet is most likely going to be a person of religious influence. Someone who has great religious influence around the world. And when the false prophet puts his seal of approval on anti mashiach the false prophet is going to say he's Mashiach. And all of those people who are like lambs being led to the slaughter in mixed up religion, they're all going to turn 
and embrace the anti-Mashiach as Mashiach. And so we see in the scripture that he is going to rise up into power. The scripture says that he receives a mortal wound. It appears that there's an assassination attempt on his life. Now, he's going to forge a peace treaty, a seven-year covenant. And it appears in Scripture that that covenant is between Israel and the Muslims who control Temple Mount and by extension, all the Muslim world. You say, why do you believe that? Because we find out by reading Daniel that he prophesied of one by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes who was an anti-Mashiach figure in history. And as we have mentioned to you, he wanted to Hellenize all of the nations in his reign, including the splendid land, the land of Israel. And what he did was he came in and he forbade the study of Torah. He put to death families who circumcised their children and studied Torah. He went in and he captured the temple and he offered swine on the altar and took that swine blood and put it over all of the articles of worship in the temple. And he desecrated the temple. And then because he had a deity complex. He was empowered by Hasatan. He wanted to be worshipped. And so he erected a statue of the chief Greek deity in the set-apart place, in the temple. And what was interesting about this statue is that it had the face of Antiochus. We're talking about Antiochus, the Greek sovereign of Syria. It had his image, his face, on this statue, and he demanded to be worshipped. Well, according to history, Yah raised up a priestly family called the Maccabees, and they resisted, and they fought with the help of Yah. They drove the Syrian army out of the splendid land. They retook the temple, and they reestablished the altar. They relit the menorah. They cleansed the temple. Hallelujah. But Daniel spoke of this image of this Greek chief deity with the face of Antiochus on it as the abomination that lays waste. Now, when Yeshua's taught ones asked him about end time events, he quoted the prophet Daniel. He said, and when you see the abomination that lays waste. He said, then you need to make your, your exit. And so we, from Bible prophecy, we can gather that anti-Mashiach is, after he establishes this seven-year covenant of peace, the first three and a half years, the whole world will be crying out peace and safety. Look what he's done. He's done what no other politician's been able to do. He forged a peace in the Middle East. He's going to solve some great global crises. The whole world and the global press will be lauding him. And during that time, that first three and a half years, it appears there's going to be an assassination on his life. And he's going to take a mortal wound. And it very well may be that it's videoed and all the world can see it and people look at that video and they see how he receives this mortal wound and everybody says that man's dead there's no way he could survive that he's dead he's a dead man he's a goner and yet he lives he recovers and when he recovers the global press not only say why he's a great peacemaker and a great problem solver but now they say he's a miracle worker he's a man of miracles and they say, who is like the beast and who can fight against him? In other words, he's invincible. He's invincible. Now, during that first three and a half years, many in Israel will look upon him and say, look what he's done. He's made it possible for us to rebuild our temple on Temple Mount. 
So right now on Temple Mound, there's two mosques. But there's a space there where the Jews can rebuild their temple. Now, people have asked me, well, what about us? What about we who believe? What happens to us as the dwelling place of Yah by His Spirit? That doesn't change. That doesn't change. Believers are still the dwelling place of Yah by His Spirit. But the Jews are going to have that opportunity to build their temple, the rebuilt temple, and they're going to start up the daily sacrifices. They're going to sacrifice daily. And after three and a half years, Antimashiach is going to have enough of that. And he wants to be worshipped because he's empowered by Hasatan, just like Antiochus Epiphanes was. And so the false prophet is going to set up an image. We don't know what kind of image it is. It may be an image that's projected by technology, but we know there will be an image. And the false prophet is going to demand that the world worships the beast and his image and ultimately takes his mark. Well, the Jews are not going to worship anti-Mashiach. I'm talking about those religious Jews. There are a lot of secular Jews in Israel, and I believe many of those will be deceived. But the religious Jews are going to say, no, we're not, we're not going to worship anti-Mashiach. And that's going to cause his anger to rise. And he's going to become so angry that he has been shamed by Israel that he's going to put together a multinational military force and he's going to stage an invasion in the valley by the Tel Har Megiddo. I've been there. It's a lump, a hill in a deep valley. It's the only place in Israel where a multinational military force could stage an assault against the land of Israel. And so anti-Mashiach is going to wage that war. And the scripture says two-thirds of the people will perish. And the city of Jerusalem will be sieged. Well, we find out from scripture that only one-third of the people in Jerusalem are going to survive. And they are put through the fire. They are refined as silver is refined in the fire and they are refined as gold. And it appears that Antimashiach is going to deliver the final death blow to the house of Yehuda. And just as that's about to take place, Yeshua is going to return and he's going to fight against the enemies of Elohim and the enemies of Yehuda. And the scripture says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for a firstborn. That word mourn means they will grieve, they will repent, they will perform teshuvah. The scripture says that, that a spirit of favor and supplication will be poured out upon them. And Yeshua said before he was executed, when he was living out his life on the earth, setting a perfect example of obedience to the Father, he went to the, to the tree. Right before he went to the tree, he told the Yehudim, the Jews, you will not see me again until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yah. And that is a phrase given to the Mashiach. You will not see me again until you recognize that I am the Mashiach. And they have always believed that the Mashiach was going to come and save them. And at that moment, when anti-Mashiach is coming down on them with this multinational military force, Yeshua is going to appear. They're going to look upon him whom they pierced. They're going to perform teshuvah. They're going to turn to the master in obedience and they are going to be saved with a justification that leads to true obedience to Torah and all of scripture. And then we enter in, after that we enter in to the millennial period. We know that 
the bride of Mashiach is going to be gathered up and swept away to Yerushalayim and we are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years of Shalom. We studied about that a bit yesterday as well. So this is the timeline. And I pray that you're getting this in your spirit to where you can sit down with someone and just as I have today and just speak it out. So we are children of light and children of the day. We have the scripture. We have the spirit of Yah giving us revelation. Yah by his spirit gives us the revelation that we need. So we don't walk in darkness. We know what is going to happen. We're just looking for these things. We're looking right now for the completion of the falling away. And I can tell you we are well down the road as it relates to the falling away. And anti-Mashiach is going to appear at some point in the near future. So we need to be prepared for that. Others are children of the dark. They are children of the night. And they don't have revelation. They're not reading their Bible. They're asleep. They're getting drunk, as the scripture says, at night and not paying attention. And they're going to be caught off guard. The scripture says anyone who does not worship the beast or worship his image and take his mark in their right hand or their forehead, that person is postured then for execution. And if you don't have the mark of the beast, then you're not going to be able to enter in to the global economy. You won't be able to buy anything. You won't be able to sell anything. You won't be able to go into the grocery store and get groceries to feed your family. And I believe that there will be many who are in religion who are simply not paying attention. They're being swept away with doctrines of demons and they're being lied to and they don't know enough about the Bible and they don't have a deep enough relationship with Yah to have revelation by His breath, by His Spirit, to know that this is happening to them. They will say, I must feed my family and they will take the mark just to be able to go into the grocery store and buy groceries to put food on the table for their families. They'll say, oh, well, Elohim can understand I have to feed my family. Well, Elohim understands. That's why he's given us the scripture. That's why he's given us his breath. He breathes upon us. And Yah, by his spirit, reveals things to us so we can be prepared. And so we've talked about the timeline. Today, I want to talk about some very practical things that we all need to be considering. And I just briefly want to touch on the story of Yosef, Joseph, because the story of Joseph gets into interpretation of dreams, seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. Prophetically, we are in the seven years of plenty. It's not exactly seven years. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but it's a prophetic period. Of plenty. But when anti Mashiach comes on the scene and he forges that seven year covenant, then we enter in to the seven years of famine, of hardship, of difficulty. The latter three and a half years is called the time of Yaakov's trouble or distress. And those last three and a half years, that's the time that anti Mashiach is attacking. Israel with a vengeance wanting to annihilate them. And so we as believers should love Israel, the land, and we should love the people of the land. That's why we take time and intercede on behalf of unbelieving Yehudim every time we get together because it's important to us. We, we pray that Yah would open up blind eyes and unstop deaf ears and turn hearts toward him that they might see Yeshua in the scripture when they open up the scripture. And we're praying. This is our prayer even today. We're praying for a mighty move of the spirit 
in the land of Israel that many, many, many unbelieving Yehudim will come to know Yeshua as Master and Mashiach of Israel. We're also praying for all the citizens of the nation of Israel, and we pray that Yah will move in that land as well as continue gathering up Ephraim from all the nations of the world. So let's get into this story of Yosef, and I want to get into five practical things that we all must consider at this time as we prepare for the difficult days ahead. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to begin with verse 3. It says this, And Israel loved Yosef more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a long robe. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and were not able to speak peaceably to him. And Yosef, or Joseph, dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers. So they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have dreamed. See, we were binding sheaves in the midst of the field, and see, my sheaf rose up and also stood up, and see, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, See, I have dreamed another dream. And see, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream? that you have dreamed. Shall we, your mother and I and your brothers, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father guarded the word. So his father was paying attention, but his brothers envied him. So the point that I want to make with these verses is simply this, that you are children of light. And Yah is informing you through the Word, through revelation, through visions and dreams concerning things that are ahead. You see, Yosef saw in his dreams things that would take place in the future. And so you are children of light. You have the Word. We need to get in the Word. We need to understand what's going to take place in the days ahead. And keep this in mind, when you are children of light and revelation, and you understand what's going to take place in the future, there may be people around you who envy you, who hate you, who rebuke you. Keep that in mind. Because Yah is calling those of us who are children of light to go before our families. A lot of times your wife or your husband doesn't understand. Your children don't understand. You seem all alone in the vision. But you need to take strength from Yah and move forward in the vision. And begin to make plans and take action. Because at some time in the future... You're going to be postured then to bring your family into a place of safety. Now go with me over to Genesis chapter 41, and we'll pick up with verse 1. Genesis chapter 41, starting with verse 1, it says this, And it came to be at the end of two years' time that Paro, or Pharaoh, had a dream and saw him standing by the river and saw seven cows coming up out of the river, beautiful looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds. Then saw seven other cows coming up after them out of the river, ugly and lean of flesh, 
and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and lean flesh cows ate up the seven beautiful looking and fat cows. Then Paro awoke and he slept and dreamed a second time and saw seven heads of grain coming up on one stalk, plump and good, and saw seven lean heads scorched by the east wind coming up after them. And the seven lean heads swallowed the seven plump and complete heads. Then Paro awoke and saw it was a dream. And it came to be in the morning that his spirit was moved, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, and all its wise men. And Paro related to them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Paro. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Paro, saying, I remember my crimes this day when Paro was wroth with his servants and put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. Each one of us dreamed a dream in one night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. And there was with us a Hebrew youth, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to be, as he interpreted for us, so it came to be, came to pass. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Paro sent and called Yosef, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his garments and came to Paro. And so here we see the interpretation of the dreams as being seven years of plenty. Again, prophetically, we're in that prophetic period now. And then seven years of famine, and that begins when Antimashiach forges a covenant between Israel and the Muslims that control Temple Mount and by extension all of the Muslims of the world. So we have seven years of plenty. We need to act in those seven years of plenty because Yosef stored up 20% of all of the crops that were grown in Mitzrayim every year for those seven years. He was putting away food so that there would be plenty in the land of Mitzrayim in the seven years of famine. We need to be doing that now. We need to be preparing now. Time is short. That's what these videos are all about. Go with me over to Genesis chapter 45. And we're going to look at verses 5 and 7. Genesis chapter 45. Beginning with verse 5. And now do not be grieved nor displeased with yourselves. He's talking to his brothers. Because you sold me here. For Elohim sent me before you to preserve life. So Yosef came to understand that all of the hardship that he went through, all of the things that the brothers of his household did to him, and the things that he suffered was to posture him, to put him in a place where he could preserve life. And the point that I want to make here is that the person with revelation the person who understands these things that we're talking about Yah sends that person ahead ahead of their family ahead of their sphere of influence to preserve life and so if this message is resonating in your spirit right now then you can know that you've been called and you're being sent ahead of your family ahead of your friends ahead of your sphere of influence to do the work necessary to preserve life now let's look at verse 7 and Elohim sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to give life to you by a great escape a great escape for a very troubling 
time. And so Yosef is saying, Elohim sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to give life to you and to provide a great escape. I want you to apply those words to yourself. If, if you're a person of light and receiving revelation, then that's the calling that Yah has placed upon you. Go with me over to verse 10 of chapter 45. And you shall dwell in the land of Goshen and be near to me. This is Yosef speaking to his brothers. You and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And I shall provide for you there in that place called Goshen. Lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty because five years of scarcity of food are still to come. And so two years had passed and there were five years more to come. And Yosef is telling his brothers, because I received revelation, because I went before you, I'm able to provide for you and keep you from coming to poverty and great harm in the remaining five years. And so what this tells us is that Yosef gathered his family from that place of great famine. They came up from the land of Canaan. He gathered them up and the man of revelation, the man who understood what was taking place, had prepared a place of safety and was going to provide for them. See, I'm saying all these things because I want you to take these words upon yourself. If you're a person of revelation, if you're understanding what I'm talking about, you have a special calling. Yah has called you to go before your family, make a way for them, go before those who are in your sphere of influence. And ultimately you will lead by revelation. You will draw them in. You will bring them into a place of safety and you will provide for them during the seven years of famine. All right, so what is famine? Let's just take a moment to talk about famine. Obviously, famine is a lack of food, a lack of nourishment. Any kind of famine is detrimental to the health of the human body. And Yeshua prophesied that we're gonna face deadly diseases, deadly diseases. Let's take a look at that, Matthew chapter, 24 we're going to look at verse 7 Matthew chapter 24 verse 7 it says for nation shall rise against nation and rain against rain and there shall be scarcities of food and deadly diseases and earthquakes in places and so we want to talk about what we can do to prepare for deadly diseases. I told you we were going to get into the practical. So many people are interceding now that Yah would just remove COVID-19 and all the variants from the earth. And we should pray. We should pray. But a lot of people are hoping that Yah is going to come and just deliver us from the disease. And we continue in a lifestyle that draws disease into us and so what i want to talk about over the next few minutes is what we can do what is our part how can we prepare for deadly diseases we need to get our bodies strong we need to come to a much higher level of health we need to give our body what it needs to be able to fight off deadly diseases yah has created in us an immune system it has the ability to fight off deadly diseases when we don't hinder it and weaken it through our poor lifestyle choices. 
We have a covenant with Yah, if we understand it. But Yah is the ultimate steward. He expects us to take good care of our physical bodies. What? Know you not that your physical body is the set-apart dwelling place of Yah by His Spirit? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, show great esteem to Yah through your body and by your spirit, which are His. And so He commands that we be good stewards. We have a covenant over in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25. This is a promise to us as we walk in covenant with Yah through His Son, Yeshua. Yah says, I will bless your bread and your water and take sickness from your midst. In other words, your food is your medicine. When you walk in covenant with Yah, when you are fueling your body with the right kinds of food, get off the junk food. Quit eating so much salt. Stop eating all the processed foods. Stop mistreating your body. If you'll eat properly, if you'll eat organic food, if you'll eat live food, if you'll eat food that's not sprayed with herbicides and pesticides, then Yah says, I'm going to bless your bread and your water. There's going to be power released on the food that you eat. The food that you eat will be blessed. And I am going to take sickness from your midst. The problem with so many is it's what they are eating that's bringing sickness into their midst. And so we need to reverse that. We, we need to take good care of our bodies, eat the right things. Yah said, I will bless what you eat and I'll remove sickness from your midst. Now, let me just give you a few practical things. We don't have enough time to go into great detail in all of these things, but I just want to give you some things to think about. It's time to get healthy, to have a strategy for health. Did you know that when you study the miracles of Yeshua, Yeshua's miracles are done in motion. He said to one person, stretch out your hand. He told another one, rise up and walk. He told another one, go and cleanse yourself. And so what I want to say is there are miracles in motion when you're stagnant, when you're lethargic, then you're inviting disease into your body. How are we going to get healthy? We got to move. We, we have to start moving. There is miracle power in motion. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And our bodies are ready to heal themselves if we'll give them what they need. Proper food, proper exercise. So set and achieve fitness goals. Have regular fitness activity. Start by just getting up in the morning and going for a walk. And then walk again in the evening before you eat your last smaller meal. Start moving. When you start moving, there's miracle power in motion. And then get your blood pressure under control naturally. Get your blood sugar under control naturally. We know that as it relates to COVID-19, people who are overweight and people who have issues with their blood sugar are high risk. So how are we going to deal with deadly diseases? We're going to get healthy. We're going to get rid of all the excess fat and weight, and we're going to manage our blood sugar. And then get off of medications as much as possible. Because a medication a lot of times will mask a symptom that you have, but cause others. And so pray about it, but as you can, as you're able, get off of medications as much as possible. Boost your immune system naturally. Give it what it needs. There are certain things that people can take even today to help your body fight COVID-19 by boosting your immune system. Then you have the blessing of walking in divine health because the body is designed to fight off diseases. Balance your hormones naturally. Work on lowering your biological age. You know, you could be a lot younger in your physical body than the number that's associated with your age. Boost your energy production naturally. Learn about natural remedies. There are a lot of natural remedies. Yah puts natural remedies in His creation, things that you can eat, things that you can apply, things that, that you can pluck up and break open 
and make a remedy from. We see in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2 that the leaves of the tree brought healing to the nations. Gain a knowledge of nutrition and stop poisoning yourself with toxic processed foods. Hallelujah. Maintain a detoxification protocol. Always be detoxing. Sweating is a great way. And when you get to moving and you get that motion going, then you'll be detoxing. There's so many toxins in the earth today. It's so important. Nurture a healthy microbiome or gut flora. That's the bacteria in your gut. Much of your immune system is in the gut. It's so important. All right. Now, I could say more about that, but we have a limited amount of time. Go with me over to Genesis chapter 45. Starting with verse 19, we'll read a few verses here. It says, And you, you have been commanded, do this. Take wagons out of the land of Mitzrayim for your little ones and your wives, and you shall bring your father and come. So he's talking to his brothers. This is Yosef. And he's telling them, take wagons from the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt and go to your land, Kinaan, and bring your father and your little ones, your children and your wives and come to the land of Mitzrayim. He's going to put them in the land of Goshen. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. And do not be concerned about your goods for the best of all the land of Mitzrayim is yours. So even in famine, you can live a blessed life. That's an important point. Even in distressing times, you can live a blessed life. And the sons of Israel did so. And Yosef gave them wagons according to the mouth of Paro. And he gave them food for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments and you could read all through there and and all of the things that Yosef did to do what what did what did he do in all of that he reunited his family he brought his family together now think about it think about how his brothers had mistreated him think about how at one point they thought about killing him and then they sold him into slavery. They mistreated him horribly. And yet, Yosef, understanding his calling, knowing that Yah sent him before them with revelation to prepare for the seven years of famine, he knew that it was his calling to bring the family together and to be one who would protect and provide for the family. And so I want to say this. Heal your family. Be the agent of forgiveness. There are some very, very difficult times ahead of us and you will need the family to be together. So you be the one who reaches out. You be the one who forgives. You be the one who restores. And by the way, when you forgive and you are a source of restoration, that also brings physical healing to you and provides health to fight off diseases. And so think about this. The famine will facilitate. This is a strong point. The famine will facilitate the unification of the famine. Yosef's family, in other words, the, the house of Israel, didn't come together until two years into the famine. So be patient and be prepared. The famine itself actually facilitates the reunification of the family. Now, don't wait until the famine. Start that work now. Reach out to those loved ones, to that sibling who you haven't talked to in five years, to that mother, to that father that you're not speaking to. They're going to need you. You're the person of light. You're the person of revelation. You're the person called to go before them to prepare the way. Reach out. Start showing love. Start showing forgiveness. Start being the agent of restoration because the family is going to need one another during 
this very distressing and difficult time that is ahead of us. So the future crisis will be greater than the challenges of the past. Unite over a common vision of preparedness for the famine. I want to say that again. I want you to get this. The future crisis will be greater than the challenges of the past. I'm talking about the family crisis. Unite over a common vision of preparedness for the famine. Hallelujah. All right. Now, let's go to the third point. We can look over at Genesis chapter 46. We're right there, real close by. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and slaughtered slaughterings to the Elohim of his father, Isaac. And Elohim spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Yaakov, Yaakov. And he said, Here I am. And he said, I am the El Elohim of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Misraim, for I shall make you there into a great nation. I myself am going down with you to Mitzrayim, and I myself shall certainly bring you up again and let Yosef put his hand on your eyes. And Yaakov rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel brought their father Yaakov and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Paro had sent to transport him. And they took their livestock and their property, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came into Mitzrayim, Yaakov, and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed he brought with him to Mitzrayim. So here's the point. Do not be afraid to relocate where Yah sends you. So, in real estate, they have a statement that is location, location, location. It's all about location. The point that I want to make here is that in these days that we're in, every one of us need to be praying. And we need to be looking. You need to find your Goshen and get there. Find that place where Yah is leading you to. That place where you can be away from the large cities. Get out of the big cities. That's where the controllers are going to control the masses in the big cities. There are acres and acres and miles and miles of open land in, in this country, if you're in the United States. There is land out there where you can grow crops and store up food. And we need to be doing that. We need to be saving up like Yosef did. He saved up 20% a year, and he had plenty for seven years of famine. And so we need to begin growing our own food and storing it up. We need, as I mentioned, to get out of the big cities. I call that reverse migration. At one point in our nation's history, all the people were moving into the cities. And now the people of light need to be moving out of the cities. What are we talking about? We're talking about real social distancing, literally distance your family from the masses of people. Don't be swept in to what the controllers are doing in the big city because you waited too long and got stuck there. Get somewhere that is isolated, where there are plenty of natural resources and fresh water. Find a place that has several pathways of escape. So find your Goshen and get there. And then we want to go to the fourth point, and the fourth point is found in Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, starting with verse 17. It says this, And Paro said to Yosef, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go. Enter the land of Canaan and take your father and your household and come to me, 
and I give you notice, the best of the land of Mitzrayim, and you eat the fat of the land. And so the fourth point is, it's time to reconnect with the land. We must reconnect with the land. Learn how to grow your own produce. Remember what we said about those who take the mark of the beast? Only those who take the mark of the beast will be able to go into the grocery store or go into a department store or purchase a vehicle or purchase a ticket for a flight or a bus ticket. You will not be able to purchase anything on the market unless you have the mark of the beast. And so you won't be able to just walk into a grocery store and get food. So what are we going to do to be prepared? Learn how to grow your own produce and then develop a respectful relationship with livestock. See, there's going to be a meltdown of the financial system in all the different nations. And ultimately, there will be a new one world global financial system with a global market and to tap into it you're going to have to have the mark of the beast. And so we have to be ready for that. And there's going to be a redefinition of wealth. Wealth is no longer going to be how many numbers you have in a bank account that you can access electronically. But instead, wealth is going to be, have you found that piece of land? The wealthy person is going to be the one who knows how to grow food and can sustain his family off of the food that he's able to grow. The wealthy person is the one who has a respectful relationship with livestock. And so wealth is going to be redefined. It's going to be redefined as the one who has the resources necessary to survive. And so I want to encourage you to be a wealthy person. We need to go on and make our homes eco-friendly and energy sufficient. We need to learn about freeze drying food and dehydrating food and canning and, and bottling. We need to learn how to use natural and organic methods to grow produce. Learn effective ways to use technology to grow food like hydroponics. Again, we have to break away from the world's system of commerce and become self-sufficient. Now, we've gotten to the final point that I want to talk about. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 47, starting with verse 13. Genesis chapter 47, starting with verse 13. It says, Now there was no bread in all the land because the scarcity of food was very severe and the land of Mitzrayim and all the land of Canaan became exhausted from the scarcity of food and Yosef gathered up all the silver that was found in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Yosef brought the silver into Paro's house. So we see silver as a means of purchasing. It's a, a certain level of tradable assets. Verse 15, And when the silver was all spent in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan, all the Mitzrites came to Yosef and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the silver is gone. And Yosef said, Give your livestock, and I give you bread for your livestock, if the silver is gone. So they brought their livestock to Yosef, and Yosef gave them bread in exchange for the horses, and for the flocks they owned, and for the herds they owned and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year had ended, 
they came to him the next year and said to him, We do not hide from my master that our silver is all spent. And my master also has the livestock we owned. There has not been left any before my master, but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and let us and our land be servants to Paro. And give us seed, and let us live and not die, and let the land not lie waste. And then look at verse 23. And Yosef said to the people, Look, I have bought you and your land today for Paro. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall be that in the harvest you shall give one-fifth to Paro, and four-fifths is your own as seed for the field and for your food for those of your households and as food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the eyes of my master and we shall become Paro's servants. All right. So under this heading of store up tradable assets, that's very important. You're not going to engage in the global economic markets. So how are you going to get things that you need? You're going to have to store up tradable assets. We're going to enter into the bartering system. You're going to have to have something of value that you can trade for something you need. And so begin to store up tradable assets. Don't be a victim to the trading mechanisms of those in power. We've talked about that. Don't take the mark just so that you can go get groceries. For your family. Store up assets that will be of value to people. You know, you're not going to be able to buy a new vehicle, and so you're going to have to be able to keep the one you have running. So if you have a stock of parts, if you have tires, if you have some items that people need for farming, if you have soap, you can trade food if you have a great surplus. But keep in mind that you're going to have to have something of value for you to be able to get from others what you need. So we see three levels here of tradable assets, silver. Silver and gold have always had some value. And they will continue to have some value for a season. But over time, they're going to lose their value. Livestock and food assets will hold its value. These are things that you can use to barter with others to receive things that you need. Livestock and food assets. And then thirdly, land and personal services. So we pull that right out of these verses that we just read. But personal services... Someone who has a skill especially. You'll be able to do something for someone in exchange for something that you need. So I'm sowing these seeds. We're not going to be able to go into great detail in all these points. But I want you to begin thinking about these things. So let's briefly revisit these points. The first thing is we need to bioprep. We need to prepare our bodies to fight off these deadly diseases that are coming on the earth. This is not the end of it. When COVID-19 is over, it's not the end of it. It's only the beginning. So we need to get healthy. Get serious about that, folks. Get serious about that. The second thing is, Yah is using you to go before your family. Start the work of reuniting the family because the family unit needs to come together to work together in a common vision of being able to survive the difficult times ahead. Forgive restore, show love, be the first one to step out and reach out a hand of reconciliation. And then number three, find your Goshen and get there. Find that place of safety. Find that place where there are good resources and a, a good, solid, reliable source of fresh water. 
a place where you can get into it easily, but get out of it even easier. And so find your Goshen and get there. Get out of the big cities. You've been hearing me say that all week long. Get out of the big cities because the controllers are going to be controlling the masses in the big cities. Social distance yourself and your family from the masses of the people. Number four, reconnect with the land. Reconnect with the land. So many people have no clue about how to grow anything in the land. They've been living in the big cities. Reconnect with the land. Get you a piece of land and start making it produce. Start working it. Start farming it. It'll bring you a lot of peace just being reconnected with the land. Have a respectful relationship with livestock. Begin storing up food. These are very, very important points. And then fifthly, store up tradable assets. Think of something that people will need during the seven years of famine, during the seven-year covenant, and begin storing up those items so that you can barter with others to receive what you need. That will be your new source of wealth, resources that you can trade for things that you need. And so my prayer is that these words have inspired you. They have you thinking. You're being proactive. You're going to start acting on these things. And you are going to go before your family and your friends and your sphere of influence. You're going to start making plans and preparing the way so that at the time that's necessary and needed, you can bring in your family and be a source of safety and a source of provision for them. Hallelujah. After watching this video, you may have been convicted in your heart and you're asking yourself the question, what must I do to be saved? Well, the Bible tells us that there are some things that we must do to be saved. And so I want to give you seven things according to scripture that we must be willing to do to walk the path to salvation. The first thing is we must believe with all of our hearts that Yeshua Messiah is the son of the living Elohim, that he died on the tree for our sins, that he was buried and raised from the dead. And then we must perform teshuvah. The word teshuvah is a Hebrew word that means to turn to the master in obedience. It's not just enough to say, I'm sorry for what I did in the past. I'm sorry for my sins. But instead, you leave behind your lifestyle of sin and you embrace the word of Yah and you have a willingness and a desire then to be obedient to the commandments. And then thirdly, you must submit yourself to water immersion. When you're immersed in water, the Bible says that you are buried with Yeshua Messiah and you are raised to walk in newness of life. The scripture says that old lifestyle of sin is cut away from your life. And it's the place where the circumcision of Messiah takes place. That's the circumcision of the heart. And you receive the want to heart. In other words, you want to obey. And then that leads us to number four. You also receive the power to be obedient. And how do you do that? You pray to be filled with the set apart spirit of Yah. And so when you're filled with the spirit of Yah or you're immersed in the spirit of Yah, not only are you given the power to be successful within the context of the covenant and to love Yah the way Yah wants to be loved through obedience, but you're also empowered. You're given gifts of the spirit. You're empowered by Yah to be useful for the reign of Elohim and to go out and to receive that harvest of humanity that Yeshua has charged all of his followers to go out and receive. And then we need to read our Bibles regularly and pray continually. The scripture says the word of Yah is like milk for a baby. And so if you're just coming to belief, it's like you're a little infant in your belief and you need to grow. How are you going to grow? You need to eat. And what do you eat? You eat the word. It's like milk for a baby. So eat regularly in the word and pray continually, the scripture says. Isn't it wonderful that you have a relationship with the Father and now you can have an ongoing conversation with the Father? That's a beautiful thing. And then number six, 
You need to find a local fellowship that you can engage with. If you can't find a local fellowship, then get connected with a ministry that's blessing you and then stay connected. And then number seven, the scripture says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. What that tells us is that salvation is not just a moment. It's not just a prayer, but instead it's a life. And so you have to live this life of walking in the will of the Father, walking in His ways, following after Yeshua and His example of obedience, loving the Word, obeying the commandments, praying, and being filled with the Spirit of Yah, being led by the Spirit of Yah. And if you'll do that throughout your life, the Scripture says when you get to the end of your life, you will be saved. And so I want to encourage you, once you start, don't quit. Don't give out. Don't give in. Don't back up. Continue in this walk. And if you'll do it and not stop, then at the end of your life or when Yeshua returns, you will be saved. And so I want to encourage you, if you are ready to make a commitment to these things, then why don't you send us an email at info at triumphandtruth.global and we're going to respond right back to you and we're going to celebrate with you the fact that you have believed upon Yeshua and you're ready to walk in Yeshua's example of obedience, walk in a lifestyle that pleases the master, and we want to encourage you in it. And so send us an email. We want to celebrate with you. If you endure to the end, the scripture says, you will be saved. Hallelujah. It's my sincere desire that you've been blessed by watching this home worship video resource. And I want to encourage you to be a blessing by sharing this video with your family and friends. And also, I want to let you know that we have a premiere of the weekly home worship video resource on Arab Shabbat. And our online community, our family of belief comes together and we enjoy the home worship video resource together. We have a live chat. We greet one another. We fellowship with one another. It's a blessed time. So if you're unfamiliar with that, this is your invitation to be a part of our premiere every week. All right, as we bring this video to a conclusion, I wanna speak a blessing over you. So I wanna invite you to stand up where you are, lift up your hands and begin to worship as I speak these words of blessing over your life. Yah bless you and guard you. Yah make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yah lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen.